to the professional development. So, for instance, one of the additional things that we're working on right now is uh, the partnership with local colleges and universities. Right now, we don't have a pipeline of workforce that are flowing through for training purposes. That is something in 2020 that we certainly want to build upon to ensure not only do we have the workforce for today, but our future workforce and recruitment and development needs are spoken to. What if one conversation could save a life? What if one new process or new product could save a patient from surgical harm? Broadcasting from a hospital basement near you, you are listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the global voice of sterile processing. Each week we spotlight the best practices, products and people from around the world who are disrupting our profession and helping you fight dirty. Every instrument, every time. Join us as we have the kinds of conversation that matter and give our industry the kind of voice that it deserves. Nyt on aika mennä puhdastakin puhtaamaksi. And now it's time to go beyond clean. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with William Bryant, Senior Director of Surgical Services at Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx, New York. Will has nearly 21 years experience as a registered nurse, the past 15 of which have been in perioperative services. William is on the heels of completing his Doctorate of Nursing Practice degree in Health Systems Leadership. And Hank, this is how we wound up getting connected to Will because he has some past experience with a good friend of ours, Sean Flynn. And Sean mentioned the work that he is doing on his doctorate, and it ties right in with a main theme here at Beyond Clean, which is education, education, and education. And so I'm really excited to see how he's promoting not only education and sterile processing, but also a real foundation for training new employees in the field. That's right, Justin. I have seen onboarding go very well in sterile processing. I was a huge fan and nerd of getting creative with the onboarding process when I was a manager and director, but I've also seen it go very, very poorly. And unfortunately, as a result, when you have a poor onboarding process, and I'm really looking forward to talking to Will about the dangers of that on this particular show, because I think it's important for frontline technicians, if you're going through onboarding as a leader, if you're responsible for that, and also for an administrator who is hopefully giving resources to these departments to make sure that their onboarding process is successful. So hopefully, all of those types of folks will listen to this interview and glean a lot of good ideas from it. All right. Well, before we get started, as a reminder, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, or Instagram, Beyond Clean podcast. Find our videos, including Fighting Dirty with Hank Balch, Real Talk with Bob Mars, and Beyond the Headlines with Mike Matthews at youtube.com slash beyondclean. Beyond Clean also offers social media and podcast consulting for vendors, along with survey preparation and remote consulting services to hospitals, surgery centers, and clinics. For more information, email info at beyondclean.net. Finally, Beyond Clean is moving to a new form for issuing CE credits for our podcast. Beginning this season, we will be certifying the entire season of eight episodes all in one. That means just one quiz at the end of the season for all the credits on one certificate. We'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Will Bryant, Senior Director of Surgical Services at Montefiore Medical Center. And Will, you were referred to us by a very close and personal friend, Sean Flynn, and mostly because you've been doing work for for quite some time on your doctoral thesis around the topic that we're going to discuss today on the podcast, which is getting onboarding right and really building it around a competency-based model. So really excited to hear what you put out there. And honestly, nobody's really talking about this in the industry. No, it's a 
it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the body of work that I've been, the, the journey really that I've been embarking upon the past couple of years, specifically looking at training and education and uh, trying to set up several processes in such a way that it yields um, the outcomes that uh, perioperative leaders are looking for and also begins to put it in line with how other disciplines within perioperative services, whether it be nursing, uh, surgical technicians, and so forth are viewed. So again, thank you for this opportunity and looking forward to further discussing the project. Well, we have a great partnership with CCI, and we've done already one conference with them. And it's a big focus of ours to begin bringing periop and sterile processing together, especially away from the job. But I know that many of our podcasts are approved for CNOR credits through CCI. And so we're going to have a lot of periop representation listening to this podcast over the coming weeks, months, and even years. And so I thought maybe you could talk about your background first, and then we'll lead into what prompted your research and especially the area of study around orientation programs in sterile processing. Absolutely. Um, I've been a registered nurse for nearly, nearly 21 years. Uh, spent the majority of my time in the Midwest, uh, 15 years at the Cleveland Clinic Health System before I made the decision um, to, to go to the West Coast. But of the 21 years in nursing practice, 15 years have been in perioperative services, 10 years as a perioperative leader. Um, most recently, and as you've spoken to, came to the Bronx, New York, part of Montefiore Medical Center uh, associated with the Albert Einstein School of Medicine, it's a quaternary care facility um, covering five campuses, five of the 12 that are affiliated with the health system. You know, we, we span the surgical range in terms of offerings from transplant to acute neurosurgical procedures, about almost 800 associates at this point. So it's grown in shape, magnitude, impact, size, scale, um, doing about 43,000 procedures annually. So. Um, you know, the impact within perioperative services, the community that we're part of is felt, um, it's, un it's understood, it's appreciated, and we're looking to grow that in the coming year. And uh, honestly, um, being the metro major metropolitan area, this is, this is a unique opportunity, and I'm glad for the experience, and I'm just glad to partner with those in the surrounding community. So, yeah, it's, you know, the, the journey's been it's been buried. I've been in Silicon Valley. I've been part of the number two hospital in the, uh, you know, from a, a reputation perspective to serving a population of a, a different magnitude here in the Bronx, New York. I, I, I'm appreciative. I'm very appreciative. That's probably the best way that I could sum up everything over these 21 years. With that background, then, you know, across the country and, uh, and tremendous experience in period, but you could have really focused on a number of different things for doing research. So what drew you in particular to looking in, into how these orientation programs and onboarding processes are happening in the sterile processing space? Well, I think probably two distinct things. First, sterile processing, uh, when I first became a leader, uh, was one of those areas that was prone to turnover, being viewed as an entry-level position. A lot of the programs back then were certification-based, not necessarily viewed through the lens of, a, a discipline through which a person could experience a career over the duration of time should they have chosen to go down that path. Secondly, I noticed too that periop or that sterile processing evolved to the point wherein um, there was a need for distinct resources to, to oversee the training and educational platforms. And depending upon where you were at times, sterile processing was fortunate to have its own educator, its own infrastructure to oversee the onboarding, the annual competencies, continued professional development, certification, attendance at seminars, presentations, and so forth, whereas there were other points in time where the leader or the nursing educator would be responsible for overseeing uh, the training, the education, really the breadth of all of that's entailed from a training and educational perspective. And I think just because of how technically influenced and very nuanced perioperative services, including sterile processing, has evolved, there's a distinct need to have educators overseeing the unique practice settings. 
whether it be pre and postoperatively, intraoperatively, of course, sterile processing, anesthesia technicians, and so forth. So really, I think those became the catalyst for me to to take a, a deeper dive into, hey, let's let's unravel this mystery and see where we can take it. Right. Well, to translate what you just said, for any administrators who may have missed it, <laughs> you're arguing for education positions, educators over all of those areas. And again, like for this show, you know, we're primarily focused on that sterile processing need, but I'm glad that you brought that up. And I just want to highlight that again. It's come up on, on a number of, of our previous episodes, but at such a critical technical position at educator position and many many times i have seen facilities who are in a in just a state of of disarray and and disaster in some sense and it's because for years and years and years that responsibility had been assumed you know to be just part of what the manager is supposed to do as well and especially when you start looking at some of these larger and complex uh, departments asking a manager to do everything that a manager has to do plus do this education is just really asking too much. So I'm glad that you brought that up. And so transitioning out of that, then I really want to get in to a, a high level overview then. Like you have really set the stage, you know, for what drew you into this. What are some of the, uh, the needs in the industry? But in this project and research in particular, how would you describe the purpose of it? What did you look at? And really, how did you go about uh, the actual studying of this? Yeah, so the purpose, as defined within my quality improvement project, was to determine the effectiveness of competency checklists from Amy, which we all know to be the Association for the Advancement of Medical Instrumentation, on new hire associate self-efficacy with department competencies. And very succinctly, it's how do new hire associates feel um, in terms of their ability to perform department competencies in the core areas as defined by Amy, sterilization, decontamination, prep pack, inventory management at the beginning and then at the outset or at the conclusion of going through the onboarding process using a competency-based validation approach. In terms of how we designed the study, so it was really – uh, from a literature perspective, they deem it as a mixed methods. So mixed methods is qualitative and quantitative. So all new hire associates during the eight-week measurement period, independent of the years of experience that they had prior to joining Montefiore Medical Center, sterile processing department, were included within the study. So in a two-week fashion, each new hire associated, associate rotated through the respective areas that I mentioned, prep pack, sterilization, decontam, and inventory management, they had a buddy, um, which in most other institutions would be referred to as a preceptor, um, as well as the, the respective manager of that campus overseeing the process. So using the competency-based assessment tools from Amy, we evaluated performance as they rotated through each operational area. And from a qualitative perspective, what I would do as the project manager, uh, the DNP scholar, which is the doctor of nursing practice, practice scholar, I would meet with each new hire associate at the end of every week for check-in purposes, really to debrief the experience, to see how well things were working. Was there any, was there anything relative to the onboarding process that needed to be improved upon? whether it's just general wayfinding to do you have all the accesses that you need and so forth, as well as asking them were they still content with their employment decision. So it was really underpinned by establishing a relationship with the, the new hire associate to say, we're going to evaluate your performance. We want to set you up for success. From a competency perspective, evaluate your ability to perform the task, but also understand do you understand the rationale or can you provide the rationale behind what you're doing, underpinned by ensuring that they were properly supported during that intervention process period of time, which would ultimately culminate to them with them finishing their onboarding process. So, um, you know, from a quantitative perspective, the competency checklist, 
you know, that was really the framework. The qualitative was to ensure that that all their needs as a new hire associate within the department were spoken to and addressed in near real time as possible, but also beginning to insert those state interview questions, right? Because the literature clearly demonstrates that a person is most impressionable during the, the early onset of being introduced into any work environment, whether it be sterile processing or anywhere else from a healthcare perspective. So you want to set that up in such a way that there are no questions, there, are, there is no stone unturned in terms of how they feel or their perception of the experience. If it goes well, the likelihood of retention increases engagement, outcomes, and so forth. If it doesn't go well, invariably there's a cost associated with that, not only for the, the new hire themselves, uh, the buddy who's probably working at 50% capacity as they share, they mentor, they provide guidance, as well as the fact that, you know, either within that onboarding period of time, however duration it may be, for us it was three months, um, or shortly thereafter, the likelihood of attrition increases dramatically. So we wanted to, to, to mold the process and experience in such a way that all angles were addressed not only from a core perspective, which Amy speaks to, but also giving sort of extended learning opportunities, going into the OR, working with supply chain to you know, pick the cases. Um, here it's a bifurcated process in terms of sterile processing, supporting the instrumentation, supply chain, marrying the case cart with supplies. But as much integration as we can lend a person during the early phases of them coming on board, the literature clearly spoke to the fact if you designed it correctly, the outcomes would be commensurate with what you were looking for. Kind of in a nutshell, that's how the project was designed. Again, only eight weeks in, with the idea that you would continue to study independent of how statistically significant or insignificant your results may have been during that small sample size. Yeah, your reference you know, to the cost alone just reminded me of – I have a number of conversations that we've had with our chief medical officer, Dr. Peter Nickel, and actually we did a podcast a couple of seasons ago, you know, where he looks at true, you know, cost of employment and, and cost of attrition and turnover when it comes to training. As you said, you got preceptors and all of that cost comes back to what you're saying is if you've got a sufficient onboarding process and you're driving uh, both competence but also that kind of cultural adoption yeah, huge implications there. So that's a terrific point. I wanted to to follow up though on your reference uh, to the Amy competency checklist. Is this something that you created internal to your department and to your project, or is that something that's already out there in the industry that's available for folks to find and use themselves? Well, that's a great question. Obviously, this is a, available in the public domain through ISHM. Um, so I think the the competency checklists were produced in 2000 or published in 2015. So that was the framework that, uh, or through Amy, I'm sorry, I, I said Isham, um, but that was the framework that was used to support the competency based approach for this particular quality improvement project. Um, and I would advocate any perioperative leader sterile processing leader that has oversight for sterile processing, central services, or some combination in between based upon how their institution is structured uh, to take a long and hard look at adopting the, that standard platform to support onboarding orientation and really continued development of professionals in the sterile processing environment of care. Yeah, that's really great. And I think one of the things that's lacking, and we talk about it all the time, is just good data, good studies, and justification, right? Because if you're mm -hmm. going to go to anybody at the C level, or even maybe not even that high, maybe you're a sterile processing manager or director, and depending on which way you sometimes report, could be supply chain, could be perioperative services, but there's got to be a justification. It really helps to have these this kind of information available to help you make your argument. So as you went through this process, maybe you could describe some of the more important or even surprising results that you came across along the way. 
Well, I think from an importance standpoint, sterile processing, very similar to other disciplines, is, is key in this regard. You have to stay committed to the onboarding process and not invariably pull staff or new hire associates in to serve as staff resources on those days when you're short staff, uh, you have a lot of call offs, whatever the circum you know, volume is higher than anticipated, you have to stay committed to the process. Um, period, point blank, end of story. The more you pull, the more or the more you mobilize people within the flow of the day, or if they have multiple precer- preceptors and they're getting very perspective, it just doesn't lend itself to um, a successful learning opportunity. Secondly, you have to place the new hire associate at the center of the learning experience, almost asking them, hey, as you go into the next phase of the onboarding process, what are the objectives or the learnings that you're seeking to gain out of this experience more so than what I think you should learn as you rotate through the different phases of care? By that, I mean there are clearly things when you're in Deacon's hand that you need to learn. You need to learn how to watch to function the sonic unit, um, you know, how to, to properly clean lumens. There's a lot of adjunct tools that are out there, so, such as boroscopes. And so, you know, I don't want to interject, uh, you know, or uh, recommend a particular brand, but there are a lot of nuances that are really part of the framework, the fabric of rotating through each area. Many, as many associates come to you with experience or fresh out of school, you know, they, they have began to, to formulate their mental models for how they want to engage the things they, that they deem as being priorities as they come into the sterile processing environment of care. So you want to understand the experience and sort of the output through the lens of the person going through the experience as much as you as a leader, the preceptor, uh, the educator, uh, would want to heap upon that person what they think they should learn or what they sh- what should be the priorities as they go through the experience. You know, I will stand on this hill, but having an educator to oversee every person going through, every new hire associate going through the onboarding process, it's a resource that will pay for itself a hundred times over if you are able to justify the acquisition of that person. Um, again, I've seen far too many instances where it's been incumbent upon the manager. Vendors come in and provide uh, that level of support, or there's a dependency upon the vendor. Um, you know, there maybe you have a, a learning, a learning uh, engagement or a, a learning arm of the organization that provides some ad hoc. There is nothing like having elbow support from a subject matter expert, especially for your most impressionable resource within the department. And that's the person that is newest to the department who really doesn't know um, as much as how to get from the locker room to the department and, and, and maybe to the cafeteria. So I would think, I would say those were a lot of the learnings that came out of this shortened engagement that we did that uh, we've been able to capitalize upon, integrate as the standard of care and definitely will carry forward uh, into the foreseeable future here with the Montefiore Medical Center. When our chief medical officer got involved, not only with Beyond Clean, but specifically with sterile processing, he had written an article and then he wound up coming on as one of our early guests on the podcast and then came back for a second visit. But he's since done a lot of presentations across the country. And one of the things that he identified was there was something like 2,500 articles on sterile process, I mean, on diabetes for every one article on sterile processing. He said that's a really big issue because we look at sterile processing and it, it potentially is a $100 billion waste issue annually. And diabetes, we know, is $250 billion. So there's something there that is really disproportionate in terms of research. And then when you and I connected to prepare for this interview, you had said something extremely astonishing as well, that as you began to look at this topic, 
topic and prepare to do your doctoral thesis on it that you noticed that there also was not a lot of information out there. Can you describe kind of your review, uh, or I should say, can you describe your lit review and what you found in terms of periodicals on in this area? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you do, um, you know, when you go to publish, you look for the strongest level of evidence possible, which uh, typically is, um, you know, research across multiple institutions is randomized up to and including the quality improvement initiatives that are out there. Oftentimes, there are subject matter experts who offer perspective um, on certain topics. But the long and the short of this analysis was summed up in this way. From a peer review journal source point of view, there was very little to be had on sterile processing, central services, central processing and distribution, all the key words that you would look for when it came to say, came to evaluating what was out there, what was the science saying. There wasn't a whole lot of substance readily available in so much I had to go down the path of really leveraging what was available from a nursing point of view in the perioperative space or some of the key tenets that nursing as a discipline was using to say, hey, let me, although I know the direction that we needed to take this uh, this particular quality improvement project, let me take some of those tenets, adopt them into the sterile processing environment of care specific to my institution that, you know, obviously I'm part of right now to drive this initiative forward. So, I, you know, I don't want to, to classify it or deem it as being embarrassing, but if we're saying that something is important, which sterile processing clearly is, there is no shortage of studies that have been produced, articles written, um, news stories that have been socialized where Deficiencies have been captured, uh, places have been put on immediate jeopardy, closed down for a period of time until the operation was right side, but yet it was hard to back it up with credible literature out there within the market to suggest that uh, the environment, the discipline was being given the proper attention that it required relative to the changes that were occurring, high-level disinfection and so forth, and the continued importance sterile processing from a surgical perspective was playing ac across the country. The two just didn't align themselves. And I think that's when I, when I did the literature review and I noticed the shortcoming in that regard, it was all the more impetus for me to continue on with this work and ensure at the conclusion, when there's an adequate sample size and data in hand ready to present, it will be presented. It will be shared internal to our institution. I've been accepted at AO Orange for next year as a, from a poster presentation point of view at the 2020 Congress. Whatever channel is available, this message will be shared because it's just too important not to. Yeah, it is so important, and we have to keep placing an emphasis. And even training, to some degree, could be much more automated as we move forward into the future with the technologies that are available to us. But let's just talk about what we're dealing with today. Specifically, you had been talking about how much need there is to have an educator to really oversee that onboarding process. But let's talk about what happens when something is short-circuited or the orientation process is disrupted because all of a sudden, hey, we have a staffing need and we can send this person out to do something very basic in terms of their task. But now all of a sudden, they're not really getting a complete orientation and they're not going through the process in an ideal way. Why is that so dangerous? Well, I think what tends to happen in that situation is that people gravitate to what they feel most comfortable doing. So it's not an uncommon phenomenon, although we've already established the fact that there's minimally four core areas of care, of operations within any sterile processing environment that you go to, maybe five, maybe six, depending upon how things are segmented out. Um, it's not an uncommon phenomenon for people who have short change onboarding experiences to only be able to function optimally in one or two areas. So it limits 
their touches within the operation. Probably from a fulfillment perspective, they're not as satisfied or content with where they are relative to where they can be. And then from an outcomes perspective, we've not even gotten to the, the process measures, the outcome measures, whether it be tray preparedness, uh, case cart readiness, things that, you know, IUSS and so forth, it will translate. And that is one of, this becomes one of the reasons why sterile processing in the eyes of the beholder is oftentimes not viewed favorably because those one or two instances where something, where a tray that was 95% complete made its way to the OR but didn't have what it, it needed, the optics therefore become, well, we've all heard it, right? Those people in sterile processing don't know what they're doing. Well, that's not necessarily the case, but by design, the outcome that was produced was produced because either people weren't trained properly, uh, the environment of care is not set up in such a way to efficiently carry out the task, um, people aren't developing because they don't have the right level of resources in place. So like all those things make a difference. And when you see the, the story repeat itself, you can say, hey, I'm going to condone it, I'm going to coach it, or we're going to do something appreciably different. So uh, what has been the expectation or the norm from sterile processing to the OR, from sterile processing to the ambulatory clinic, inpatient environment of care, and so forth, will no longer be. And I think by virtue of this effort and this journey, this track that we began to embark upon within our institution, we're signaling to everyone internally, as well as to those with whom we will continue to share this message, that no more, no more. It's, it's a science, it's a discipline, it needs to be treated as such. It's gonna be infused with the right, right level of resources, the proper oversight. It will give, be given the right investments up to including educators, looking at career ladders, all those other things. Things are flowing through as they need to flow through. People are being onboarded correctly and ultimately it translates at the point of care. Now, I'm pretty passionate about that, but it's, you know, a lot of people don't understand the science behind sterile processing. So you kind of have to start sort of small, little by little, build your way up to, you know, by virtue of what goes on in the area that for far too long was considered to be, I mean, I saw in one article it being re referenced as the place where dishes are washed, okay, which we clearly understand not to be the case. But what we do here has a large degree of impact. So I, I share within my project, just for an example, in 2000, in, in this year, across five campuses, 64 ORs, supporting annually 43,000 procedures, 1.4 million instruments anticipated to be processed, over 4,000 scopes, high level disinfected. And that's not even for an environment of care that really processes flexible scopes on a daily or at a high level relative to, to some other cell processing environments of care, but the impact off of 1.4 million touches going through the process that will subsequently be used on some patient, pediatrics, geriatrics, adolescent, adult, that stuff adds up. So if the touches are going to be of that magnitude, if not greater, supporting a broad spectrum of surgical types, we need to make sure that it's structured soundly, that it flows correctly, and that it translates at an appropriate level. Yeah. If anyone knows me personally, they know that I, I am not a fan of flying, and yet for my job, I fly way more than I like, you know. But it makes me hyper aware when I'm walking in to the plane and I look up at the cockpit and I can tell, ooh, somebody in that in that cockpit looks a little young or maybe there's an extra person in there so it looks like some kind of uh trainings going on right and then uh, my mind starts racing and i remember all of these protocols that well you can't fly a, a commercial plane unless you have like twenty thousand hours of flight time right and and all these little check marks are are there to ensure that safety happens in that 
training and competency in the airline setting. And I know like that's kind of, that's the, the analogy that has been used so much for healthcare, but in sterile processing, if we're really admitting that what we are doing is breaking the chain of an infection and literally saving lives through clean, sterile and, and functional instrumentation into the operating room, or If we're not competent and if we're short-circuiting this orientation process, we're sending things that are not safe to the operating room and to the patients. And if the airline industry can say we're not letting anyone do this until they meet these competency metrics, well, we can do that too in healthcare. And the only reason that we're not doing it is because we have decided that we're going to risk it. I love what you're saying is we don't have to risk it. There are processes and programs out there to actually fix this problem, and I'm just glad and excited someone is out there asking and doing the hard work of researching this to show everyone else that, hey, guys, this works. And, um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know where I'm going with that, but I just want to throw that out there to say uh, thank you, and I'm excited about what you're talking about. Yeah, I think sterile process, I think there's two two areas that are really important to surgery. It's making sure that patients are, you know, if they need to be seen, are seen, optimized, you know, whether it's their primary care, so the AC areas. I'm going off, I'm all going off the path, the beaten path, but it's really to make a point between how patients are seen before they have surgery. Make sure they're optimized. A lot of patients that we take care of are sick. Um, they have comorbidities at uh, chronic health conditions. A lot of people, for you know, at this juncture, use the emergency room as their primary care mechanism and so forth. So between how patients are seen and optimized before they have surgery and sterile processing, I've always posited that those are probably the two fundamentally key areas for how well a surgical environment of care is overseen and how it flows versus it not, you know, meeting the intent from an outcomes perspective, engagement experience and so forth. So I, I think you know, myself, like many other perioperative leaders now more so than ever, we just appreciate the fact that sterile processing has to be spoken to at a high level. You know, whether it's renovating so you can have expanded space, uh, appropriate workbenches, lighting, uh, the adjunct tools, proper instrument tracking system, to the professional development. So, for instance, one of the additional things that we're working on right now is the partnership with local colleges and universities. Right now, we don't have a pipeline of workforce that are flowing through for training purposes. That is something in 2020 that we we certainly want to build upon to ensure not only our not only do we have the, the workforce for today, but our future workforce and recruitment and development needs are spoken to. Encouraging people to go to the seminars, whether it be the local chapters, uh, going to Isham, Amy. Um, there are many other venues in which they can participate. It, it all matters because at the end of the day, our workforce is telling us that if you care about me, I'll care about you. It's a bi-directional relationship. And within this quality improvement project that, that I did, we used the psychology of change framework from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement as our theoretical framework. And basically within that, it, it talks about the importance of taking the person as being an inactive participant to being actively engaged in their learning journey. And really that, that was the, the, the underpinning of this entire process and will continue uh, to be how we engage at a very high level with anyone that comes in and out of our doors, up to and including now a lot of sterile processing associates that want to go back to become a surgical tech, a registered nurse. I'm all for it. I'm all for it because that represents how people are growing, how they're maturing, uh, how they're being properly guided and mentored and saying, hey, you know what? I think I can achieve more with this sterile processing or I can leverage my learnings and allow that to translate into something else from a healthcare perspective. So it, it, it's an awesome period of time to be a part of. I, I think I probably have a lot more appreciation from sort of taking it at the grassroots level partnering with the sterile processing managers, the leadership team, and um, really setting the stage for it to become, for it to become something special, unique, 
and centric to Montefiore Medical Center. Well, not really centric to Montefiore Medical Center, but something that we can say, hey, we lifted off the ground, we've refined, we've iterated it, and now we're going to share it because it needs to be shared. You know, this is far too important of a message just to keep contained to ourselves. So much ties in with the whole educational foundation, including the topics that you just brought up, including career ladder, which is a topic that we discussed very early on in season one with Allison Sonstely. And even in the very first episode we ever did, we talked about partnering with infection control and how that also can be a career path or career ladder. You mentioned going back and becoming a surgical tech or a registered nurse, but also I've seen many sterile processing professionals move into infection control. Having this foundation and definitely partnering with local colleges, technical colleges and universities is going to help build that pipeline. And we know there's a shortage in staffing. So it really does require a multi-prong approach. The last thing that you said that I really want to hit home before we get done is the fact that the process has to engage the learner. And because that engagement is what ultimately creates accountability, and it's that accountability and that passion that's going to wind up driving this industry forward. Mm -hmm. So, Will, super appreciate your appearance on the show today. Thank you for bringing the perioperative perspective to the podcast. I know everybody will enjoy that. But also thank you for being a champion for sterile processing. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. That was Will Bryant, Senior Director of Surgical Services at Montefiore Medical Center. And Hank, this is necessary work. I know we referenced Dr. Peter Nickel, our Chief Medical Officer, twice during this interview, but research is really his wheelhouse. It's something that we've talked a lot about getting more involved in at Beyond Clean. And if we can be just that global voice of this type of research and help promote the work that Will's doing, and I'm very glad to hear that he's going to be presenting it at AORN next year, the better this whole industry is going to be. And as he said, surgical services isn't just the OR. It's not just sterile processing. And we talk about it time and time again that it's that partnership. And so advocating the other department within surgical services always reinforces that partnership. And that's something that I think we have to keep dialing in on as we continue to have these conversations. There is so much more work to do, but I'm encouraged by talking to guys like Will because we've got some bright folks, some driven folks out there in the industry who are asking the right questions and And one of the beautiful things about our podcast is we get to connect those folks and those minds and create the synergy, like the whole connection. Like we end up finding Will through our connection with Sean Flynn, and then we're listening to Will talk, and I'm thinking the whole time, like Peter Nichols has been talking about all these similar things, and yet from a totally different angle of the cost angle, and then we're bringing these conversations together to drive the industry forward like we love to say. It, it's a beautiful thing to see, and it's a humbling thing to be a part of. So uh, super interview. I cannot wait to get this out to the audience and hear some feedback. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support Beyond Clean by subscribing on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank and myself, thank you for listening to this week's edition of Beyond clean.